Bro. F8. Reload. <laughs> <laughs> all right welcome to another episode episode seven is it yeah seven um today got a do i don't even know how i have mates like this but i have uh i have a guest that is not just any type of doctor uh an anesthetist actually which is crazy i don't even know how we're mates because i'm the biggest degenerate and uh <laughs> I don't know, I could probably say the same about you, to be honest. You, <laughs> That's true. I'm pretty, <laughs> I'm pretty much a degenerate. <laughs> Jordi, with me today is, uh, is one of my good mates, Jaffa. Feel free to say hello. The camera's right there. Hey, guys. So, Jaff, you're, a, you're an anesthetist. Yeah. Um, so, I've been doing it for a little while now. So, I've been purely doing anesthetics for about four years, almost five years now. Uh, so when you see me smoking in front of you, do you think oh, this guy's going to die in like two years? <laughs> do you see some stats and stuff? <laughs> no, it's not. It's not too bad. I've seen, to be honest, the most unstoppable patients are the ones that smoke like chimneys. Like they just don't die no matter what you do. <laughs> the most unstoppable patient. <laughs> doesn't matter what you do. They just don't. <laughs> I was like, where's this guy going? <laughs> That's true. But I've seen so many people that are like, um, especially Arab people. Yeah, exactly. They're like at Titanic. They're smoking yeah. shisha and like just chugging away every no, day, bro. That's so true. Like they've been smoking for years. You ask some of them, they've been smoking 20 or 30 smokes like for the last 30, 40 years. But, you know, they're still alive and kicking and they're still pretty strong and active. Yeah. It's only when you actually open them up and their lungs are black. But otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise. I don't know why we're laughing. It's actually I so know. bad. It's probably it what my lungs look like too, bro. Far out. But you know, otherwise they they still manage to get around, still manage to do their stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy how much the human body can handle. Mm. Um, but I'm, I'm excited about this episode because um, you kind of sometimes forget that your mates do some really cool stuff. Mm. And then, yeah, like I've known you, bro, I've known you for so long now. Yeah, I think since year eight or year seven. Yeah, bro. It's, it's a high like, school, so that would have been when we were 12, right? Dude, how did you do that <laughs> math so quickly? Um <laughs> That's easily 18 years, bro. Yeah, that is nuts. <laughs> 18 years I've known you. More than half our lives. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then I kind of forget that, like, what you're doing is actually pretty pretty freaking amazing, like, career-wise. career, career wise. But then also what you do is a really important step in the for the purpose of, like, surgery and, sh and shit like that, mm -hmm. right? Um, do you want to just talk about very quickly about what it is that you actually do? Yeah, it's pretty diverse. So I think... Before I actually found out about what anesthetists do, um, it was my thinking that, you know, is, they're just is that, there. Is that the actual pronunciation? Yeah. And, and <laughs> yeah. So anesthetist. It's not anesthetist. No. It's anesthetist. <laughs> so anesthetist is how we pronounce it in Australia. Overseas anesthesiologist. Um, it's just a bit longer. I'm not sure why they decided <laughs> to call themselves a bit differently. But here in Australia, it's anesthetist. Anesthetist. Okay. Um, essentially, our role involves um, all of perioperative medicine, meaning that we cover or we look after patients from before they have their surgery. So that involves optimizing them, educating them to actually getting them off to sleep um, and then looking after them while they're asleep and then waking them up and then ensuring that they wake up comfortably and safely. And then in addition to that, we also have other roles in the hospital as well. So it's a purely pretty much a hospital-based specialty. Um, we also look after patients in pain. So we're experts on pain. We're experts on um, doing epidurals. We have quite a big relationship with yeah, right, the obstetric department too. Yeah. Um, and that also involves and extends into doing cesarean sections with spinal anesthetics, um, but also taking care of them afterwards as well and ensuring that they have a comfortable stay. And um, in addition to that, also supporting our colleagues in other critical care um, specialties, for example, emergency medicine and intensive care as well. So we sort of offer our support uh, in terms of managing any difficult scenarios that they may have. Um, so it's quite a varied specialty, which I didn't really appreciate until I started. And then once I did start, I realized how much of a how much of a variety there is in terms of what we do. Yeah, dude, I've never heard you speak so professionally. What do you mean? <laughs> I've never heard you speak like a professional before. <laughs> Holy true. shit, that was really impressive. I was, I don't know, I gotta, I gotta see my face later because I was like. Wow, this is pretty. <laughs> I've never heard you speak like this, bro. <laughs> That's really impressive. Holy shit, man. Yeah, so, so we do quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, fuck you, dude, man. Holy shit. So, so what do you do now? Because, like you mentioned, like it's it's incredibly diverse that you cover mm. a lot of aspects of 
I suppose, surgery theater. Um, yep. I had no idea you'd be involved in cesareans. Um, yeah. not, sorry, not just cesareans, but also epidurals. But when you say it, I'm like, yeah, it makes sense. Mm. What, have you, what have you done so far? So essentially throughout our training, we've got to become experts in every single field um, because that essentially is the role of anesthetists. They do need to know everything um, when it pertains to their own specialty. So I guess day to day, what I'm doing now, it just depends on what is needed. So on most days I get allocated to a theater and that could mean any sort of manner of operations. So I could have a day where I'm doing general surgeries. I could have a day where I'm doing obstetric cesareans. I could have a day where I'm doing neurosurgeries or um, vascular surgeries. So it's quite unique. Um, no two days are the same. So I think that's what I enjoy a lot. So I do get bored pretty easily in I know pretty much do, everything. I know so you do, man. it's nice having a specialty where I'm still really on my toes a little bit. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So you step in, like, let's let's play it day by day. You wake up and your hours are crazy too, right? Yeah, it hasn't been too bad. Um, the place I'm at now, I'm currently working at Nepean. Um, right. So it's 40 hours a week. So it's actually pretty It's crazy. like a standard kind yeah. of working week. But the, your start and finish times are very different. Yes. Whereas most people will do like a nine to five, they might do a, a graveyard shift, they might yep. do like an evening shift. But with you, it can be kind of be like any time of the day. Yeah, no, that's true. It's there is shift work as well, so similar to emergency medicine and yep. intensive care as well. Um, but most of the time, if it's just a standard day, it's um, I usually wake up pretty early, and I try and aim to get to hospital at about seven twenty in the morning. So not not terribly early. Mm. Um, our patients sort of start coming in at around 7.30, 7.40 and we get them ready for the operation and that includes getting essentially a needle into the back of their hand so that we can administer medications um, and then bringing them in by 8 a.m. and then we get them off to sleep and then the operation usually begins around that time. And then essentially there's usually, depending on what type of surgeries you do on the day, um, it can go up until 5 p.m., 6 p.m. We're supposed to only operate during daytime hours up until 5 p.m., and anything, Is there a reason for that? Just beyond that time, um, it's mainly a staffing issue. Uh, so although, resources, yeah, yeah, yeah. So although I could continue working longer, I don't really mind. Um, nurses have their own schedule. The, yeah, right. the surgeons also need to do other things. Um, the surgical nurses need to do other things as well. So it depends mainly on that. Yeah. Um, because there's quite a few things or different cogs inside the hospital that need to all work in unison to actually make things flow appropriately. So as a result, um, we tend to only do days that are limited to about 10 hours. Holy shit, you're smart, bro. <laughs> like I've never, I've known this guy for so long and we've never had a serious conversation about work and he's hearing you now, I'm like, I believe it. When you, if I have, now I believe it because before we used to talk shit, we used to be like, oh, if I get Jaffa as my anesthetist, I'm going to get fucked. Um, but now, like, bro, you, you sound so legitimate. You Dude, sound I like an actual doctor. Like. I still talk smack. It makes no, it doesn't matter. So, like, when you're putting someone to sleep, you're like, yeah, bitch. Oh, dude, I say some weird shit. It's, uh, but uh, they usually don't remember because we give them something to forget things. I, I remember when I, I told my ACL. And I was going in for surgery mm. and um, I was already high on something. Like they gave me something beforehand because yeah. I, was, I was in a lot of pain. And then I go into the surgery and then um, the anesthetist comes through. Am I saying mm. that right, anesthetist? Yeah. The anesthetist comes through, puts me, like I'm on the, um, what do you call it, just the normal kind of rolling bed thing. Mm -hmm. And they're just about to transfer me onto the operating table. And I was talking shit with the anesthetist mm. and I feel like, he has these conversations all the time because yeah. I was like, I want to try to fight this. And I was like, yeah, you can try, bro. You can, <laughs> you can definitely try. And he's kind of reading me like um, almost like a, like a legislation thing. He's like saying something to me. I had to sign something. Mm. And I'm like, this is a bit weird. I'm doing this all before. Like I'm high as shit and I'm high as a kite and I'm also just about to go into <laughs> surgery and I'm signing this yeah, what was it, a waiver or something. Technically like, you're not supposed to. But. Oh, really? <laughs> Banks are in hospital, bro. Oh. They, got, <laughs> they, they don't follow procedure. Is it Banks are public, is it? Pub uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was mm. Banks are public, yeah. So, you know, I'm not surprised. Um, <laughs> and I remember he was he was saying something. Oh, yeah. Um, I was like, do I got to keep my undies on for this? And he's like, yeah, bro, we don't want to see any of that shit. Like I don't want to see your like your, your doodle or whatever just flopping about. And I knocked out. Bro, within like three seconds of him administering, and he was counting down 
Mm. And and he was like 10, 9, and as I was like blacking out, I'm, uh, I can hear him go, all right, here he goes. He's gone. <laughs> what do you do when someone knocks out? You're just like, do you say some weird shit? Like yeah, what's so the weirdest conversation you've had with someone just before <laughs> they get knocked out? So usually pretty much all the convos go around there. We Just by chatting to them, we can tell how nervous they are. And depending oh. on how nervous they are, we actually need to give more medications to get them off to sleep. So that sort of gives us a nonverbal cue as to how much we'll need to administer Holy um, shit. for them before they go off to sleep. And obviously the younger you are, the more you'll need just right. because your body's just a bit stronger. Uh, more tolerant <laughs> to it. Exactly. It's the craziest part of me having surgery is when I woke up, the first thing I asked the nurse was, um, uh, no, I didn't ask the nurse anything. Like I pressed mm. the bell. She came, but I was so high because <laughs> um, I was pumped. Like they, they gave me so much morphine, right, to yep. deal with the pain. Um, and then she comes through and I forgot what I wanted to ask her. Then my, the first thing I felt like just what physiologically was like, is it physio- biologically? Mm. I can't sound smart in front of you, man. Um, <laughs> uh, was I needed to pee. Yeah. And then so she comes through and, and, and I go, I need to pee. And I tried to get up and she's like, you should not get up. I'll get you like a little, like one of them blue, blue bottle things. things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, cool. She gives it to me. She draws the blinds. I um, open up my gown and I'm shocked. Call the nurse back. She comes through and she's like, what's the matter? And I'm like, the anesthetist has told me I didn't need to remove my undies. But I'm looking at my ding dong right now and it's gone. <laughs> We're on my undies. And for some reason I was hell bent on going, they're Calvin Klein undies. They're not your average Calvin Klein undies as well. They're like like the thread count on them for not, like is like over a thousand, super comfortable. Why would Where you are they? I need them back. I don't know, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, I think she just had enough of me. She was like looking at me like, oh, just another idiot patient at Bankstown. Uh, and she's like, I'll, I'll look for them for you. She never did. But what happened? Why would they have taken it off Mondays? So we usually get patients to remove their underwears. So why did this guy tell if, me to keep uh, them on? <laughs> even if um, there's no <laughs> sort of reason for us to go near it. Um, and a lot of the time when you're off and you're asleep, we yeah. do give um, like intravenous fluids. And so we be careful as to how much we give, especially for someone that doesn't have a catheter in to help them pee. Yeah. It sounds like in your case they didn't. Um, no, they definitely didn't. So maybe maybe you peed your pants and they're like, oh, crap, we should get rid of this while he's asleep and <laughs> clean him and we'll just chuck it out. <laughs> but normally what happens is if you are wearing your undies, they take it off and they put it in a bag and they put your label on it. Right. And it's supposed to just go with your belongings because there's a right. separate bag for your belongings. Um, so it's uh, I'm not sure where it went, but uh, that should not have happened. <laughs> right. Thanks down, man. Just bloody your banks down. Um. So how do you how do you decide? Like I know how you decided you wanted to become an anesthetist, um, mm. and I, I think we'll get to that point throughout our conversation. But walk me through high school. Did you always want to be a doctor? Uh, no, not really. So in high school, I was pretty lost, man. I didn't know what I wanted to do. To be completely like honest, like everyone, really. Yeah, yeah, like I think, and especially you know the school we went to, it didn't really sort of help us in terms of telling us what options there are beyond high school. It was really just focus on doing this, memorize whatever notes you've got, and then just try and score as high as the you can. Highest, which which and, you did. <laughs> and then, yeah, yeah, but the problem with that is that we don't really know whether this is what we want to do. There was no sort of exposure to yeah. anything that um, that would have been of interest to us. And even those career nights we had, you know, they didn't really give oh, us much. Yeah. Remember, there was they one were, in Auburn or something. Right, just, they were useless. Yeah, they just never really helped us. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> Now, um, what's, what's, I'm, I'm realizing two things right now, but I want to share a story about Jaffa one day. I remember, was it the two unit exam? You go in, you come out, everyone's like, man, I don't know how I did. I don't know how I did. And you said the same thing. You're like, I think I did shit. And then you bloody got like full marks basically. I think somehow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? I remember that exam. Dude, yeah. I remember like, and everyone's like, the hell, bro. <laughs> You're like, the, the, you came out of that so not confident and you, you t- literally got 100 or the highest mark you can possibly get on that exam. Yeah, I remember that exam. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was hard. But then I think when I went through my answers again, that's when I realized, oh, actually, I might have done pretty well. Yeah. But like at the time, it's always hard to tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true, true. And then the other thing is uh, I'm realizing, I, I don't know why, but I've got really intelligent friends. I seriously have never had a proper conversation <laughs> about you, about work. You, bro, you're fucking intelligent, man. It's because we have so much stuff, other no, stuff no, no, to no, talk we're about. We're just always doing dumb shit. No, man. We've got kids. We've got Baldur's Gate 3. It's hard, <laughs> it's hard, to, it's hard to beat that. <laughs> 
<laughs> Diablo. Exactly. Like, right. What was before that? Bloody Val, Val, Valheim. We, that's true. We were playing. <laughs> we played till late. Yeah. There's yeah, always a lot of other things that we were doing. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. So, but so, this is nice. so high school, and you do really, really well. Mm. Um, which you know, I think it was always kind of like when I looking from from the, from the outside, I'm more like, oh, it's Jaffa. Jaffa is just like an artist. He just mm. photographic memory or whatever. <laughs> but what is it actually like for you? Like, no, how, 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 <laughs> what, what, what was studying actually like for you? I guess high school wasn't too bad, but I think that was just the nature of our school. They yeah, really yeah. just made us rote learn things True. until it just stuck in our head. So it didn't matter. Like we could just rock up to school and they would tell us what we would, what we would need to know. Yeah. And that was enough, <laughs> which didn't prepare me well for like med Uni school life because I, yeah. I could not do that because the, I think the amounts of knowledge you needed was quite a bit. And yeah, so I, that's right. I struggled a bit more there. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, if, if I remember right, um, you went, you got into medicine at UCID. Uh, no, I got into med at Bond. That's right. What did you do at UCID? Because I remember you were at UCID for a yeah. short amount of time. So I did. So I did want to do engineering initially. And That's right. Yeah. I remember. <laughs> I remember because we Jaffa and I. I think how we got close was you were the only one of us boys in our whole whole cohort that had not only had their P's but also had your own car. Yeah. <laughs> and and we used to play um, soccer all the time. I think every other weekend. Mm. And you used to be able to take me home, but I think you didn't like having to drop people home, so you kept playing Taylor Swift. No, I I didn't mind dropping it. Oh, really? I actually just like Taylor Swift. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> I mean, I don't hate you for 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 liking Taylor Swift. It's fine, but uh, I think that's how we started getting close, and then we started hanging out more, like fishing yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Um, um, and I remember, yeah, I remember that conversation. In I think when we were fishing, and you were like, "Yeah, I want to do engineering at uni." Um, and what made you kind of go? engineering and then go to bonds because that's a big step yeah like, so um, like not anyone can get into bonds university yeah so i started off um doing biomedical engineering because i thought you know there's a little bit of medicine and a bit of engineering i think my parents were always sort of pushing me towards medicine yeah as, you know, like as with Jaffa, any Asian Lava, you know <laughs> be a like you got, exactly right i think it's the classic first generation asian, asian family yeah, yeah. thing no, right? well they met them they, they met well right like yeah, they, they just so. wanted the best for you yeah it was and always good intentions you always had the potential to to to, to do something like yeah. this yeah no that's true and then so i did engineering and it's very different from what you imagine because i like you know like you said before i enjoyed maths quite a bit mm. and then i thought engineering would just be an extension of that but um, engineering in real life isn't the same. It's very different. There's a lot like more. Like real life application engineering. Yeah. yeah and then speaking to like one of our good friends, Imran now, um, and seeing what he does at work every day. Driveways. Yeah. <laughs> he does lots of work with driveways. And I guess um, there wasn't too much maths involved and it was just very different from what I envisioned. Right. Uh, so I figured I should probably think about jumping ship um, while, whilst I still have, you know, good marks from high school, because as oh, you, right. as you get further into your uni degree, um, they start to look more and more at what you perform or how you perform at uni. And I guess the degree I was in was a bit more challenging, did need quite a bit of work and it was quite in, like quite intense maths. So, and I wasn't performing as well as I did in high school because I was getting, I think a bit lazy. So I figured I should chop shit. It's, 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 <laughs> no, and I think that's like the experience everyone gets going, and I won't name drop the school, um, but the experience everyone gets going to this particular private school is because yeah. we're literally like cattle spoon-fed information. Very true. Um, it's almost a miracle to fail, so I'm, I'm like the one in a billion. Um, but they spoon-feed you everything and then you get to uni and it's like a, just self learn everything. Yeah, you got to exactly. you got to teach yourself. You've got to <laughs> actively seek knowledge yourself. And True. It, it was, I remember feeling well. I, I, I guess it, not as much as like yourself, but I remember mm. going, "The hell is this?" Like I stepped into a chemistry class. Yeah, and it was like Chem one hundred and one. Just and I expected it to be like, "Oh, this is the periodic table. <laughs> this is blah blah blah." No, but it was straight into um, ah, uh, what was it called? The thing. There's like this apparatus, and you've got to like diluted whatever i don't, can't remember mm. the process but like straight into that mm. and i'm like shit i don't have no <laughs> idea what the fuck is going on um but yeah it um our school didn't really promote uh really seeking out information on your own no that's like there very was true we were just basically cattle just bloody grass-fed 
mm. everything. We were like just pr- premium Wagyu beef, bro. <laughs> they gave us massages <laughs> every day, gave us the best grain so that we could yield the best results. That's very true. And I guess yeah. socially as well, it, the school didn't really help us. It wasn't as bad for you, but I think... Um, yeah, because I was never at school to begin with, bro. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I don't I know. Think- <laughs> I, can't, I got away from it a little bit because of how uh, of how much of a degenerate I was at school. <laughs> but yeah, I think for me it was a bit more challenging going into uni because uh, I was a bit more antisocial. I think I chose to sort of hang around more with my friends but from, from school, school. Yeah, which, it's just easier. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, which I don't think there's anything wrong with it. But, you know, eventually you do have to, you know, broaden your horizons and which you have i mean yeah. <laughs> going to like um like your daughter's birthday party the other day you've got like a whole network of friends just you know outside of your like our social circle yeah and i have to credit moving into state um in increasing that sort of social potential because if i think i think if i stayed here i would have just remained <laughs> just stuck in my bubble just the, the, so. the same yeah yeah no it's important i think yeah um i'm just not like not only just to develop your like you say your social potential mm. but also develop yourself as well like there's a lot that you can learn from other people outside of your own social circle and yeah. and by doing so you learn a lot about yourself as well no that's I think very true the moment that you moved to bonds i remember visiting you Mm. Bro, what a crazy trip that was that too. was fun <laughs> so so jaffa had like this little dorm like just for him <laughs> and somehow we managed to fit how many of us were there? I think it was so like many. five all together. You had <laughs> one bed, no pillows, nothing, and we're just all sleeping on the ground. <laughs> I think we went and like stole some uh, oh, yeah, we mattresses did. from yeah, like, we did. I was like, boys, quick, quick, yeah, quick, bring it up. Yeah. <laughs> right, it was fun. It was fun. But that was, that the, was good. <laughs> that was the closest I'll ever get to becoming a doctor, <laughs> going to Bonds University. What but, a uni, but it's huge, man. Yeah. It's, it's massive. It was a really good uni. It was uh, definitely a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. So, so, all right, cool. So what did you need to do to get into Bonds University? Was there an entrance exam? Was there like a similar mm. exam like UMAT that you had to do, like a yeah. similar IQ level exam? So. In terms of how Australia does medicine entry, it's broken up into either undergraduate or postgraduate entry. Um, undergraduate being straight after high school with no pre-existing degree and postgraduate medicine being you have to do a degree first. Um, right. So most unis are probably undergrad, but there's also quite a few postgrad unis as well. But to get into undergraduate medicine, which is a bit quicker because you don't have to do a degree beforehand, um, the requirements are usually some evidence of a score. So um, your HSC score, um, if you did an IB, which is the International, the International Bachelorette, yeah. Yeah, which is um, there are equivalent scores for it. Um, you need to meet a certain criteria um, or a certain threshold on that. And then secondly, you also need to do an undergraduate admissions test, which is UMAT. I think now it's called UCAT or something. But essentially that exam is a very non technical exam it goes through different sections where each part tests a different part of your personality your knowledge your intelligence so it's like an iq eq type exam exactly so like section one is reading through a journal article and answering questions as quickly as you can so that teaches you how to skim things really fast i think section two was um emotions so because i guess up until that exam came out a lot of doctors just socially weren't very adept so mm. um, I think that this was a this was a change or yeah. an attempt to change that. Um, so there were questions based on emotions, like how do you think this person feels in this situation, um, which wasn't too challenging. And then section three was just shapes and colors and numbers and like what comes next in this pattern. So very much like an IQ EQ test. Um, and depending on your score, you get a percentile. And then if you're usually in the top 10 percentile, um, you get invited for an interview, assuming you've met all the other requirements and then once you get an interview they grade your interview and then if you're in the top whatever number of spots they'll give you an offer to study medicine um, is that just in general study medicine yeah, within australia pretty much what about for bonds so bond was a bit unique because um because anytime i talk to um anyone who's interested in becoming a doctor like bonds is like the hogwarts of medicine bonds <laughs> is like like you need to go to this school if you want <laughs> i think it's the other way around bond is i don't know it's got a bit of a bad rep because it's a private uni so right. what that means so you gotta is, have money yeah already. essentially you've got to pay yeah, yeah. you've got to pay out of your pocket as opposed to other unis where it's yeah. hex um but the benefits that uni offers is just it's a bit shorter 
um, the cohort is smaller and I guess the classes are smaller. So theoretically the education is it supposed to be, be better. better. Yeah. Um, but I guess the only reason I ended up at Bond, um, which I don't regret at this stage, um, is that, again, as I was saying, I was pretty antisocial and interviewing was definitely a weak point. Mm. So despite getting interviews in universities here, um, I just didn't perform too well. <laughs> I wasn't good at speaking. I wasn't good at um, getting my points across. So um, I mean, you can articulate yourself very, very well, well right now. Now, now yeah. I can, but that was <laughs> what, what it took changed? a while. I what think changed? going, I think going into state, yeah, um, was a big turning point for me. And then having, I think, once you start work, and that could be with any sort of profession, I think your um, communication skills will just improve. Mm. So I think you probably would have noticed that too. Once you start working, you just tend to, especially in a professional setting, right? Whether it be you know medicine, yeah, I just, or in I just finance. have to stop being a, a dickhead. Yeah, you really. just, yeah, you just, uh, you're a different person, <laughs> yeah, you, right? <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, I was talking to my my little brother, my old, and he was like, yeah. yeah, whenever I was going for interviews, I had to like cut out the Lebo accent. Yeah, <laughs> like, I have to just, like stop talking like this and exactly. like start talking professional. You like change your personality, yeah, right? Yeah, Similar yeah, to yeah. how we talk differently to our parents rather than to our friends. Yeah, yeah. We develop our own persona, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. Well, it's 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 a it's a real thing though, yeah. like. My work persona is very different to my, like, how you know me. Just like mm. how, like, we're doing this podcast and I'm like, holy shit, <laughs> I believe you're a doctor now because <laughs> you're not like this when we're hanging out, bro. That's true. <laughs> um, yeah, but my work persona is very different. I wouldn't mm. say I'm cutthroat, but I'm very um, very firm. Yeah. Is, is, is probably the but easiest way to say finance, you have to be like that anyway, right? I mean, I don't work in, like, banking and finance specifically anymore. I work very the, – the project side of things. And it's great because, um, you know, I work with very like-minded people. Um, hmm. Everyone is, like, really, really intelligent. Everyone knows what they're doing. And it helps mm-hmm. that everyone's also 20 years older than me. So there are, like, all seasoned yeah. veterans of, like, the, the industry. Um, so it's, like, help me just be chill. Mm. Uh, whereas before, like um, I was I had, I had to be firm in certain instances. There's there was a lot of red tape that I had to follow. And you're right, like your work persona is very different to how you normally are when you just interact with your family yeah. and, and and mates. Exactly. <laughs> um, but you, it's something that you learn over time. Yeah, yeah. And then as you get exposed to you know different environments, you just get better and better at it. Yeah, and definitely. I think I think that's happened within our friend group as well, right? Everyone's just sort of improved in terms of communicating uh, I mean, compared, to, yeah. compared to high school <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> definitely compared to year yeah. 11 or 12 right 100 100 percent. so um if if there was like a, a random kid right now who wanted to yeah. be a doctor um and let's say they did absolutely shit at school mm-hmm. like you know they 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 scraped by hsc and then like i i do actually want to become a doctor i'm actually a smart guy but i never gave a shit about school mm. what would your advice be to them so in that case, going through postgraduate medicine, right. so getting a degree beforehand. And I guess it's sort of a loophole, but it doesn't have to be science related. So your undergraduate degree can be something super easy. Like you said, saying like a Bachelor of Arts? And yeah, then Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of like IT even. It can be completely unrelated. Right. And you can just maximize your score on that. And then I guess the higher the score in that degree, the easier it is for you to get an interview for a university which I know some people have done. So it's all about just playing the game. Yeah, Um, okay. I guess the only um, other downside with postgraduate medicine is you do have to do another exam, a separate exam. It's called GAMSAT. I know. know. When I I had big dreams of becoming a dentist, yeah, I remember getting that GAMSAT package and looking at like because you can can buy like the actual like actual education GAMSAT package. I remember looking at it and going, shit. Yeah, it's pretty intense. It's it's way – I never did UMAP. But from hearing people who did UMAT and this absolute shit and then tried to do GAMSAT, it's like infinitely harder. Yeah. I think, I don't know, it just depends on the type of personality you are. Like UMAT is really lots of common sense, like general knowledge stuff. Oh, okay. Because all the information is there. For example, in section one, it's just read this article and quickly find the information you need and answer the question. Right. So they just bombard you with information and that doesn't really test, you know, the topic. It's more just how quickly you skim through things. Really a test about you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I feel like UMAT's probably a bit easier than GAMSAT. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. And so so you decide to study medicine. Mm. You do well, obviously. Um, after that, what, what did life look like? So you, you're trying to look for jobs now. What was the... So after you finish um, anywhere in med school, you have to do a year of internship to officially become 
um, registered with the oh, Australian. Yeah. I remember you doing this. Yeah. Yep. So then I guess I wanted to come back to Sydney because family's here, friends are here. So um, my options were limited because I was an interstate applicant. Um, but I knew my chances were highest at Blacktown. So came to Blacktown because <laughs> no one wants to go there. <laughs> oh, man, and I remember. So, I think we are playing League of Legends and you were talking about this. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I'll pick Blacktown. It's, yeah, yeah. You know, I still get to be around and it's not terribly far. Like it's not. Nah, it's not yeah, yeah, it's not that bad. And traffic back then wasn't too bad. 2017. Yeah. So <laughs> now it's horrible. But yeah. um, back then it wasn't too bad. So I picked Blacktown and then um, that was sort of where I started everything in terms of training um, officially into anesthetics. So it was good. It worked out well. Um, what made you decide so, anesthetics? Yeah, I wasn't actually sure at the time. Um, so I started my internship there and an internship basically involves rotating in different specialties. So you do three months in a general medicine ward or three months in a surgical ward and then three months. Um, it sounds like a grad program almost. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. yeah, essentially it's a grad program. It's just to get you enough skills so that you're officially registered as a medical practitioner. Yeah. Um, and you don't get any exposure to anesthetics early on. So I guess the tough part is you won't know you want to do it until later on. So you have to actively try and obtain a job in anesthetics to actually know whether the specialty will be for you. So I guess that was a bit of a conundrum. I wasn't sure whether it was worth me trying hard to get a job or a rotation in anesthetics before even, you know, applying. Um, but I figured everyone else was quite keen on getting a job in anesthetics so it was quite competitive i guess I'm, I'm a bit competitive so i figured i know bro i know man <laughs> so i figured you know if everyone else is competing for it maybe i'll compete for it too yeah and you know if i don't like it i guess i'll jump ship um and so it wasn't until my third year that i got a job in anesthetics and then after a couple months i guess initially i didn't really enjoy it um because it's quite um, it's quite supervision heavy. So it's you and someone else working with you, like a senior. Yeah. And they sort of teach you the ropes. But each, and you rotate between different theater lists every day. And so each person has their own preferences. And I guess learning what their preferences uh, are, it's like, it's a bit. Everyone's got their own style. Yeah, Everyone's exactly. Everyone's got their own biases. Yeah. yeah. And so not knowing how to do things like, someone teaching you one thing and then you applying that in another case. And they're like, and they're nah, like, no, that's not you, yeah, do it. Yeah. Exactly. Why are you doing it like that? And I'm like, cause I was taught this this morning. Yeah. And so it wasn't that enjoyable at the start, but then, um, I told myself I would apply for the training program. And then if I get onto it, um, great. If I don't, I'll try something else. And then I was lucky enough to get a spot. So I figured I'll just stick with it and see how it goes. And I guess the rest is history. I just enjoyed it more and more as I did it. And as you get a bit more senior, you get more independent and then you get to do your own things and then that becomes more enjoyable. Um, because I think the viewpoint of a lot of junior, like medical students, for example, when they come on to anesthetics is that it's quite a boring specialty. Because um, from the offset, it looks like we do all we do is press a couple buttons, get them off to sleep and then sit down and just play on our phones until they wake up. But <laughs> there's a lot more to it. And yeah. I guess once you study it a bit more, the nuances become more interesting. And then, yeah, yeah. I, I imagine there's a lot of prep work going into uh, the actual administration of the the anesthetic itself, right? So I imagine, mm. and and I'll get your insight on this after I ask the damn question. But yeah. <laughs> um, I imagine, like, based off what you told me, is you know an operation's happening, you've got to yeah. understand what the procedure actually is. You've got yeah. to understand the the patient and 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 what their needs are. Mm. How do you go? How does that? What does that preparation look like? Is it literally the night before, as soon as you get into the hospital? Like, because you've got to know all these things and then yeah. go, okay, this is the right amount that I need to administer. Yeah, so it's um, so it's tricky. So if the operation is expected, we call it an elective operation. Right. So in your case, when you came in for your ACL, elective. that's an elective operation. Yep. So depending on the patient, they get screened initially. So we look at their notes and we just, and it's not usually me. So it's usually a nurse that looks at the notes um, and determines how, whether this patient needs to come in and see an anesthetist beforehand to talk about I optimization. See. But for you, they would have seen, you know, young guy, no issues, no reason to go to pre-admission clinic, which is yeah, I don't remember it. doing that. Yeah, yeah so I, I literally got a call from a nurse, a yeah. bank stand. She's like, "Hello, hey, <laughs> are you Adam? All right, tomorrow's your surgery." I'm like, "Great." Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the waiting lists are pretty long for ACL repairs. I actually in the public. didn't have to wait that long, so man. Someone um, must have cancelled and was like, "Yep, 
I, I don't know. Hey, because um, I, I had the injury. I went to my doctor, got referred to a hospital, mm. went on a waiting list, and then meanwhile, I was still on uh, like my parents' private health insurance, and oh, they were like, good. "You should do it. You should do it." I'm like, "You should." Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll wait a bit, and then literally within 48 hours, I get a call from Bankstown Hospital. I'm like, All right, "Well, I guess I'm doing Amazing. the surgery." <laughs> I regret it though, because they did a shitty job. Yeah. Like I remember, what's the, who's the dude that looks after knees? It's like ortho yeah, something. Yeah, orthopedic doctors. Yeah. That's it. That's it. See, I don't really know much. <laughs> um, so I see that guy at Bankstown mm. um, and he's like, yeah, I'll be doing the surgery. Don't worry. I'm seasoned. I've got 40 years experience, blah, blah, blah. Mm. It turns out and and thank God for my like biomedical degree because I looked at the actual notes and I could understand what was happening and I mm. read in those notes that a freaking junior surgeon did the surgery and they fucked up. <laughs> he, he he got the graft for my hammy, stitched it together, put it in my knee, it fell apart, oh. and then he went to his senior and they were like, ah, let's leave it in there, blood vessels will go around and let it grow stronger. Mm. But the thing with ACL injuries is as soon as you're post-op, you have to start bending your knee, otherwise yeah. scar tissue forms and yeah. um, you lose mobility, which yeah. is exactly what happened to me. I had to stay static. I couldn't move my knee more than uh, I think it was 10 degrees. That's horrible. Was your mm. shit, um, and uh, for four weeks because I wanted the blood vessels to grow around the graft to strengthen mm. it. I'm like, dude, could you not have just like taken it out, fixed <laughs> it, and then put it back in? Because <laughs> it took me a while uh, in order to get to the point where I'm at today, which is like I'd say I'm about ninety percent. Um, like, mm. um, uh, got my mobility back about ninety percent. Um, mm-hmm. and that was through my own, um, my own motivation to seek help. Like, yeah. I went to see one of my mates who runs a physio at Bondi. Um, oh man, I was gonna shout him out, but I forget the name of the physio. Is it, e, is it ES physio? It's not something like that. It's in Bondi. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, and it's a good physio. They're really, really good anyway. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's crazy. Um, but speaking of crazy stories, hey guys. So I've had to take out this portion of the video. What I can say is we talked about maybe putting. Avoid putting things in places that don't belong. Let's leave it at that. Enjoy the rest of the show. <laughs> Shit. Yeah, oh, it's, there's, some, there's some crazy patients that you get. <laughs> but I think that's what's interesting. And I guess working out west, you do see like, oh, quite yeah, crazy stuff. <laughs> for sure, man. Out in the wild west, man. Black I know. Down. It's, right. it's pretty wild there. <laughs> and I guess the more west you get, I guess the bigger the population group is as well. <laughs> so I guess it, that, that adds to the challenges. You're telling me this looks super professional too. <laughs> <laughs> no, because that's essentially one of the biggest challenges that I think Western, like New South Wales and Sydney faces in terms of um, like a health crisis. Just uh, in general, people are getting bigger. And then when people get bigger, they have problems with their lungs, their heart, and then... They right. Just, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and, and especially with how GPs are now no longer bulk billing and it's now... Being. What? Really? Yeah. So um, they're not getting as much rebates from Medicare as they'd like normally. Um, so they're not getting adequately paid for their work. That's so, terrible. Yeah. A lot of medical practices have now had to do a mixed billing system where they claim for most of it on bulk billing, but you do have to pay out of your pocket. And I guess we're going to see the repercussions of that probably in the next five, 10 years where patients will just not go to their GP, will not see specialists and they'll come in more unwell than how they are now, um, sort of at the end of whatever issues they've had. So it's... Holy shit, I had no idea. Yeah, so if your GP still bulk bills, that's great. But um, a lot of them are making that transition to a mixed billing system. Dude, I wish uh, I, w- I wish I had more prepared just to ask you about that. So, <laughs> so or maybe I'll bring you in another time where we can talk about that issue specifically. We can get Nima in as well. She yeah, can share her. she can share some insight into that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, that's crazy. So, mm. and this is happening today. Yeah, it's happening. Um, I think over the last couple of months, it's become a bit more popular. Are we, and I don't know if you know the answers to mm. this, um, and we can definitely shoot another episode where I'll just do a crazy amount of research and then <laughs> share some t- uh, talking points with you and we can walk through it. But mm. I really just want to know now, like, um, do you see that bulk billing um, – reduce over time because right now you're saying that it's a majority of the fee to see a doctor is covered through bulk billing Mm. subsidized to the government 
Yeah. Do you see a future where it's going to become pretty much non-existent? Is yeah. that somewhere? I think we're approaching a system that's very similar to the States. Where Shit, really? you're having to pay for most things. What, what do you if, think motivates that apart from the government just being absolute dickheads and not knowing how to spend money? It probably is a big part related to how Medicare rebates have been. And I think especially since COVID times, we haven't seen an increase in how much value we're getting out of Medicare, yeah. which um, I can't speak on behalf of Nisus. They, they tend to get paid pretty well. Yeah, I know um, you get paid very lucrative. <laughs> but GPs... <laughs> I think are struggling, unfortunately. Yeah, so. it, it kind of sucks. GPs are like the, um, I don't know what a good what a good metaphor here is, but it it sucks that you study for so long mm. and it's an arduous, stressful process. Yeah, you become a GP, and then it turns out someone at Macca's as an area manager could potentially earn more than you. <laughs> so it's it's kind of it's kind of like like you have to do almost like a like a like a pros cons and understand the value uh, yeah. of uh, whether whether that pathway is worth it and i think mm. um you were mentioning that gps especially out like in the in the rural areas they're, mm. they're just be- basically no gps for yeah, exactly. a huge radius no that's that's very true and that's why the government is trying to incentivize, incentivize. um gps moving out into the west but you're getting rid of bulk billing. What the exactly. fuck are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? It's like you, when you need more doctors to go out in different places, yet you don't want people, you want people to pay out of your own pocket. To- yeah, exactly. And the more West you get, you know, in general, the population gets poorer. There's a lower socioeconomic status there. Yeah. And so they're more unlikely to see their GPs when they were already not going to see them in the first place. So now that's definitely off the cards. So Do you, see, do you see this happening, uh, bulk billing specifically? Do you see it just becoming obsolete? Five years time? Uh, if things is- go on as they are now, potentially yes. In the hospital system, it probably won't change. Um, Medicare will still cover you for everything. Yeah. Um, because hospitals are still raking out profits, I believe. So, so. like, let's say five years time, hypothetically, mm. bulk billing disappears, there were riots, whatever, shit comes down. Mm. And the norm is if you see a GP, you basically private healthcare or pay out of your own pocket. Yeah. Right? And the only two ways to see a GP, mm. um, which I think if the fees aren't that crazy, I think people would be okay with doing. Yeah. Um, but would you envision like areas where there is a low social economic status? Yeah. Would they just prefer to go to the hospital and see a doctor there? Yeah, and which is what's happening now. There's a potentially massive rise in presentations to ED at this point. Um, so let's say you're really sick and you want to see a GP. It's quite tricky to do that, isn't it? Let's say you want a medical certificate because you have the flu or you have right. a runny nose. Um, it's very difficult to get an appointment with a GP in the first place. And the only GPs that you can get um, referrals for on the same day are the ones that just do your private billing. And your alternative is to go to the hospital and get a medical certificate there. But because that's happening, um, hospital EDs are getting quite overwhelmed. Um, and I think Nemo can attest to it too. It's pretty terrible right now in terms of how many patients are waiting for hours at a time. Um, Granted, some of them might not be as urgent. Um, It's still quite unheard of that patients are waiting for five, six, seven hours sometimes, Um, especially on night shifts where there's, you know, barely any staff around. Yeah. Um, Yeah. It's pretty horrendous. So (laughs) it's just going to get worse in the hospital system. And I think if, if GPs struggle, Emergency departments will struggle and then if emergency departments struggle, I think the rest of the hospital also struggles as well. We sort of get the brunt of it and feel that too in theatres. What's interesting to me as well is that um, we're a growing ageing population. Yeah. Um, I think even now um, the amount of people that are over the age of 60 far outweighs the amount of people who are under the age of 30 I think is the, the most recent stat from memory mm. um, and obviously that number is only going to increase even more and so the mm. need for I suppose the health practitioner to support mm. your needs is going to substantially increase as well. Yeah, definitely. So is do you reckon there's just going to be this huge shift in everyone needing to get into private healthcare in order to basically cover the costs of getting these things? Because yeah. when you're older, it's not just a GP you need to see. You yeah. need to see someone so specialist. You need to see someone for your hip, your knee, your exactly. back, whatever else. Yeah. And waiting lists like particularly because I can attest to how bad waiting lists are in terms of operations. Mm. So for example, ACL repairs, knee replacements, hip replacements, 
Um, the waiting lists are huge, especially because COVID came around and we had to essentially stop electively doing operations and only saving spots for emergency operations. Wow. The waiting list just blew up um, and we just haven't recovered since. Um, but I think there's been a shift now. I think as patients realize these waiting lists are ridiculous, uh, more people are subscribing to private healthcare. And so the private hospitals are getting quite a boom. And there's quite a few new private hospitals that have opened up in Australia and Sydney um, to try and compensate for that. So I think we are slowly leaning towards a United States-like um, healthcare which is system, which really, is a bit scary. <laughs> it is scary. And it's, it's, it's like, why come to Australia? <laughs> I know, right? One of the benefits was, you know, socialized free, healthcare. Free healthcare. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, what the fuck are you doing, government? Holy shit, man. Where's our money going? Yeah, we're losing it. <laughs> what the fuck, man? I'm definitely going to have you – like I'll do more research. I reckon it would be valuable if like we had Nima's perspective here as well and we can yeah. kind of talk about what she faces in ED, how she got there, but then also kind of really buckle down and talk about these issues. Yeah, there's uh, lots of challenges right now in healthcare. And I guess as you were talking about before, if I saw some boy on the street and he really wanted to do med, I'd probably tell him don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> there are some really interesting ways of like making money today. Yeah. And I think it's just – I mean, like we we come from like um, a family of like people who who came to Australia with no mm. background of how to play the game, really. Yeah. How, how, like, how does this place work? How does finances work? How do you yeah. kind of set your kids up for success? And so, you know, mm. growing up, we've had to learn these things ourselves. So we yeah. didn't really get a head start like and most our, people. And would. Our school didn't help us either. <laughs> no, no, definitely did not. I mean, like, if 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 I had paid attention at school, I might have had good marks. But it definitely set you up to, in order to, I suppose, decide yeah. what you want to do. Because because there's one thing, like a lot of what really pisses me off is when people say, "Oh, you don't need to care about your ATAR much," which to an extent is true. Mm. If you don't want to pursue a professional career in like medicine engineering, yeah. becoming a lawyer, then, yeah, you don't need to care about a HSC marks. Mm. If you want to pick up a trade, then, yeah, you don't need to care about high school at all, period. You just yeah. need to get your ba- your your high school diploma and then pick up a trade. Yeah. But if you do want to become like a professional in one, any one of those industries, mm. then, yeah, you do have to care about school. You do have to take it seriously. And in your, in your case specifically, it opened doors for you too. Yeah, I guess so. And I guess... There was a bit of truth in saying like, you know, as long as you've maximized your ATAR, at least ATAR won't be the issue or the reason why. Exactly. Yeah. Like the last thing you want is say you want to become a doctor, yeah. but you don't have the grades. It's yeah. it, it. You just kind of hurt yourself exactly. um, and you get a missed opportunity. So yeah. like, for example, with Nana, like I, I won't force her to go hard and study and yeah. aim to get the best marks, but I definitely won't downplay how valuable it is to do well in high school because yeah. at least after that you have options. Exactly. Um, you just don't want to limit yourself, and I think that's what the school was trying to get at. But they just didn't. <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> they didn't execute well. Exactly. They, didn't exec- they meant well. They, they're yeah. like a they're like a typical Asian parent. Exactly. They meant well. They didn't execute. It's well. Like we went from Asian parent at home to Asian parent <laughs> at school, <laughs> which pretty much like that. That was pretty much it. That was. I it. had I had Vina on the other day, and we were yeah. talking about. Um, oh, I won't drop his name, but remember parachute. Ah, uh, yeah. Biology teacher. Yeah. <laughs> that, the classic example of spoon feeding. Um, <laughs> like he would read us um, notes from a student. <laughs> I'm That's a child ill. <laughs> Bro. I like remember he, that. <laughs> the, the bloke created notes for biology, stuck them up on that HSC website, whatever it's called. I forget now. What um, was it? Board, he, board of Studies, right? <laughs> something, something like, but yeah. like a pun on like yeah. a uh, board as in B-O-R-E-D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and you just read those notes. He printed them off and just started reading them. Um, <laughs> and insane. surprisingly, that was effective. It somehow worked. You know what? It was <laughs> because when I when, when I studied for biology, I just basically bought all those like big books of the past exams. Yeah. And then I'm like, oh, I'm using Mr. Farouk's notes. Well, they're not his. He ripped them off someone. But, you know, like I it remember works. him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that whole time at, at school, I never passed a single biology test. But then I did prelims and I studied yeah. like properly for it. And I, I got like 80. And then I did HSC. But because I was so low down the rank, like it went down to like 70 something. Oh, that's right. That was that bad system, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a. Is it a private school thing or is it just a HSC thing? I think it's just a HSC thing, right? Where depending on how your classmates go, it'll potentially affect yeah so if you're score. low ranking yeah. then yeah you're, you're gonna suffer despite how well you might do on the physical exam yeah that's a 
really bad setup. I don't know why they did that. <laughs> I feel like your marks should be your own marks, right? <sighs> yeah, but then I think the way that – because private schools don't – just get funding from school fees. So they do get funding from the government and I think they weigh up the overall score of the school mm. and so there's probably a system in place that is able to determine how well the school is doing mm. and then the byproduct of that is a system like the HSE. So in saying that, so if schools don't perform well, they don't get as much money? Don't know. Because that's sort it of sounds, how it works. It, it sounds <laughs> like it's how it works. I mean, I'm not an expert. This is just based off my observation, yeah. but it sounds like how it works. It's funny because that's how emergency departments work. So Shut if up. you don't, so you need to see patients within four hours. And if you don't meet that criteria, your funding drops. What do you guys call that? So it's like KPI. Um, do so you, like, do you have a specific medical term for it? Like uh, in, well, not no, a medical term, but no like, medical terms for it. But it's just this rule that someone came around with that patient, all patients need to be seen within four hours, even the really healthy patients that are deemed healthy by triage. Wow. And if you don't meet that cutoff um, over time, depending on what your percentage is of meeting that criteria, your funding drops, which is a bit silly, right? If you're not meeting the criteria, obviously you need more funding. Yeah, so, exactly. Because <laughs> you need more resources. School, right? yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> similar to schooling, it should be the same thing, right? Holy shit, how <laughs> messed up is this system? Yeah. Because like not only are we – potentially forcing people to go to the hospitals to see yeah. a damn doctor. Mm. Um, you've also got these ridiculous KPIs as well. Exactly. Yes. And if you don't meet them, then, oh, sorry, you don't get funding. You get less funding for the year after. <laughs> How bullshit. It's like, yeah, damn. it's a complete mess right now. Um, and I don't think it will improve for a while. And especially, as you said, the population's growing quite fast. Everyone's aging. And now no one's seeing their GPs. I think more people are just going to rely on coming in through to ED. <laughs> Damn, bro. So it's going to get worse. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, it'll be All interesting right. to see what happens. <laughs> so so I think, yeah, we're almost we're almost at time and mm. um, oh, we've had a pretty good discussion. But uh, in the medical field, and I've always been interested because I, whenever I hang out with your mates, oh, there's this one guy I always talk to. I forget his name, man. Um, he's always around. He's um, – <laughs> Like, uh, how do I explain? How does he look? What's his nationality? He's brown. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to sound racist and get cancelled. Um, he's very well spoken. Um, when you had your birthday and we're doing go-karting, he mm. was there too. I think he was like one of the first ones there. Mm. Um, he's always around. Like, like whenever you do something, he's always there. Mm. Um, uh, he works in ED as well? Yeah, yeah, he works uh, in ED yeah, as yeah. well. Raheem. What's it? Raheem, that's yeah. it. Uh, he was telling me about um, the red tape of the of the of the of being a doctor. Like, there's a lot of red tape that you got to follow. There's a lot mm. of politics actually within the the industry. Yeah, there is. And then I, I remember talking to one of my mates who's a nurse, and she was like, "It's true. It's mm. so true." As a nurse themselves, like there's like a hierarchy, and it's crazy because unlike in a corporate in the corporate world, right? There's multiple ways you can rise up the ladder. I think yeah. what most people think about climbing the corporate ladder is you get in as a consultant, you become a manager, you become a national manager. It's yeah. not actually like that. There's like many different pathways for you to earn incredible amounts of money mm. um, and it doesn't always mean like climbing the ladder this way. Yeah. It might be a little bit diagonal. Yeah. Whereas as a nurse specifically, if you're particularly interested in the hospital that you like working in, whether that be mm. ED, whatever else, if you want to grow there, you pretty much have to wait for the head nurse to die. Yeah. Before you can actually become <laughs> like a head nurse, it's like yeah. nowhere to move up. And she was telling me like everyone is so bitchy. Yeah. <laughs> and and anyway, so laying down the groundwork to ask this question: What is politics like in the medical world? It's very similar, and I think it's probably true in most professional settings. Um, nepotism does exist, unfortunately. Shit. And especially when it comes to so purely from a doctor side of thing things that are quite competitive to get onto. So anesthetics being quite competitive now. Um, and it, sorry, before I forgot to no. ask this before, but competitive because it's lucrative or competitive because most people see it as like an easy job? I know it's yeah. not. But so it's probably a bit of both. So competitive because A, it's lucrative and B, very good work-life balance, so meaning compared to the amount of hours that you need course. to put in yeah. and the days off you get. Um, that's why you're playing Baldur's Gate yeah, 3 more. Why <laughs> that's why I'm always playing games. <laughs> yeah, so because of that, those two factors, um, it's, become, well, it's become quite a 
at a sought after specialty. Right. Um, but there's other specialties as well that are even more challenging to get onto. So things like ENT surgery. What's um, ENT? So ears, nose, and throat. Right. Um, so that's quite competitive. Um, ophthalmology, so eye surgeons. Um, dermatology, that's pretty competitive because it's quite cruisy. Plastic surgery. Those specialties Course, are, yep. yeah, <laughs> uh, those, um, there's lots of nepotism involved in that. And unfortunately, that's just something that... Have you witnessed yourself? Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, we noticed that, um, for like example... Like relatives just get in easier. Yeah, relatives get in easier if your last name is, you know, you're related to some sort of surgeon or some sort of anaesthetist. You're more likely to get onto the training program a lot more easily. Um, so unfortunately, that still exists in medicine. Um, and it's quite a conservative field. So meaning that yeah. it's still the older generation. And like your friend was saying, the nursing friend, um, so there are some positions in hospitals where they'll just keep working, even though they should have retired years ago. And it's not giving any new opportunities to younger people to, to get to their grow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. And that just means, um, you turn away quite a few really good candidates for positions that they would have otherwise been fantastic at. And it's a shame, really. Um, I've seen colleagues that don't get onto anesthetics who then do something else or colleagues who have been doing, let's say, plastic surgery for years um, in an unaccredited role. Unaccredited meaning that they do the work, um, but they're not actually oh, part I of the training program. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's all about getting onto that training program because you can't actually officially practice until you're on this training pathway. And that training pathway is so limited that every year it only takes on maybe one or two people um, in all of Australia. So it's really the whole, all of medicine is like a filter. So it starts off by filtering yeah. people after high school, into medical school, into um, certain unaccredited jobs, and then it filters further and further down until you finally make it to the end. So right, it's good games. Yeah, no, it pretty much is. Like even in anesthetics, once you get onto the training program, which is competitive, you then have to sit an exam, which was probably the hardest exam I ever sat in my life. Bloody hell. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot of people, or I've heard of people that don't get through and eventually have to do something else. So it's just a hazing game, essentially. Um, but I guess in saying that, we probably do have one of the best medical systems in the world. And why if you tr are finished and you're a truly a specialist, um, you're definitely you know, the best of the best. You've gone through that intense training. Which, yeah, which is, it's, 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 I suppose, the reality of what it yeah. is, right? Because mm. um, going back to my example is, um, you know, when I, when I go see, especially a surgeon, mm. I want the best surgeon exactly. working on me. But yeah. without, it's ironic because without a system like that, yeah. You won't get the best. Exactly. And so you kind of have you can't have you can't have them you can't have it all. Yeah, really. you can't have it both ways yeah. because you know, it's nice to have someone who's and as we were talking about personalities before, um someone who's nice and friendly, but I guess if they're not good, I'd still go to the some person that's, you know, a little bit autistic but is very is good at what they do, at, right? Yeah, what they do. Yeah. yeah and which yeah. is what I think is probably more important. Yeah, and 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 speaking about, you know, specialist doctors, mm. people who like in your specific scenario, you do want the best because you don't yeah. want some like, like yeah, it's cool if someone's having a conversation with you, but you, if you fuck up my body, like yeah, who knows no. what the repercussions might be. Exactly. So yeah, you do want the best. And things, yeah, things can go wrong. And like, although anesthetics is safe, um, I think it, there are cases, people, young people dying, and I guess those are always the most traumatic cases. Yeah, of course. Um, so you do want someone who's vigilant, who's well-prepared, who's able to react quite fast. Um, because even though it is a pretty chill specialty, we do see things go wrong and they can happen. And when things go wrong in anesthetics, they go wrong pretty fast. Um, How so? So because the most challenging part of anesthetics is getting them off to sleep and then waking them up. The in-between part's okay. So it's sort of like flying a plane. I gotcha. So the takeoff part is... Quite technical, yeah. but then also the landing is yeah. too. And yeah. the landing is also technical. And then in the middle, it's just pretty cruisy. And... Because we're essentially administering drugs that pretty much render them in a state that's very close to death, so they're sort of on the verge of death. If we give them too much, they're pretty much dead. They're dead, and yeah. And if we don't give them enough, they're a bit too awake. And although you won't be awake awake, you could be you awake feel, enough that um, you, feel you choke on a tube, you could be oh, awake shit, enough that, even that you, you attempt to vomit and stomach contents comes out and goes into your lungs. It's all about timing it and also giving enough 
so that um, you're in this perfect state. Yeah. And then if you go beyond or a little bit less than what's required, then things can go wrong, especially when you're dealing with operations like, let's say, brain surgeries, and you've got aneurysms in your brain. Um, if the patient were to cough, it'd be a disaster. Like they would pretty oh, much well, bleed shit. out. And <laughs> I, I, bro, there's um, one of my favorite things to do for some reason is watch uh, brain tumor removals <laughs> on YouTube. I've watched so many hours that I think I should get that accredited, man. <laughs> I reckon I could do I could do brain tumor removals in my kitchen. Like yeah. I've watched so so many so many hours worth of videos, but it is incredible. Number one, how easy it is to get to the brain. First of all, yeah, there's not much to it. <laughs> no, there really isn't. There's like it's you've a got you got your your skin, your scalp, the membrane. You're at the brain. Yeah. It's like it's easy as that. Um, um, the amniotic fluid also. Um, no, not amniotic fluid. The fucking the watery shit inside your head. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Your skull as well. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. I'm just I'm trying to sound smarter than I actually am. Um, but what impresses me the most is the skill level of the surgeon. Mm. Um, like operating. On your head is one thing, but yeah. then specifically getting into the brain to remove the tumor itself, just that one specific section of the brain without harming anything else around it is just, I think that's why I watch it, to be honest, yeah. because it's just such an amazing display of skill. Yeah. Um, it's crazy. How do you fucking prepare for something? like? Because you can't exactly... I think it'd be even difficult in your situation too, mm. like being a junior and learning to deliver um, anaesthetic to a patient. Because like mm. when you're doing it, you're doing it. There's yeah. no, there's no really practice in between. If you fuck <laughs> up, you fuck up. Like what are you gonna do? Yeah, no. Like at my workplace, um, when I was trying to learn something, and if I mess up, it's okay. It's a mistake. It didn't really harm anyone. No one mm. really lost, you know, their life. Yeah. But in your situation, it could be incredibly detrimental to the person's health. There could be huge repercussions if you fuck up. Just even. Slightly. Yeah. And I think that's why they do get compensated quite a bit um, because there is some recognition that it's, it's quite dangerous. Yeah. Although most of the time it's safe. You're really. Oh yeah. 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 As you've explained. Yeah. yeah. I think you're really getting paid to be there when things go wrong. So even though 99% of the time it's safe, you're getting paid for that 1% so that when things mess up, um, it's on you to fix it. And do you think everything you've gone through, the studying, uh, the, the the training program, everything, has that all been really, really, I suppose, did you need to do anything apart from that to be able to be good at what you do today? Was I think, it enough? I think it is enough. A lot of the time it's just experience. Yeah. And I think learning from your seniors because when you are starting off, you are sort of always rostered on with someone that is a lot more senior and you can watch the way they do things. And um, you do learn, though, that patients are pretty robust. Um, so they <laughs> you do, mean humans? Yeah, humans. <laughs> humans are robust. It actually takes quite a bit sometimes to, uh, <laughs> to take them away. So, yeah, yeah. And I think in this day and age when we have so much, so many different ways of monitoring patients and uh, we can really react quite quickly if things do go wrong. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think in saying that it's not, not too bad. Um, and I guess with anesthetics in terms of how much you give and what you give, you sort of just pick it up with experience, like with anything, like anything in life. I think once you get enough experience, it all becomes a lot more manageable. And I think just recognizing when things can potentially go wrong is probably the most important thing that anyone can learn really. Yeah. Yeah. And it all makes sense. Dude, all right, we've been going for an hour. This is like wow, <laughs> the dude. I've seen you in a whole different light now. What like you literally, mean? <laughs> holy shit, you're I'm smart. I'm still the same holy person. Shit. <laughs> you know, the craziest thing about Jaffer is he's always been the smartest guy in the group. But mm. like seeing you in this light is is just a whole <laughs> a whole different thing. Like the 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 most. I don't know if it's like an, a testament to how smart you are, but I remember we were chilling at your place back when mm. you lived at Para. And we all just for some reason just wanted to get back into League of Legends and you were like, oh, I'm just going to buy a couple of, uh, what are they called? <laughs> League accounts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like you, you have so much knowledge and like just being able to talk to you in this setting has just been <laughs> really incredible. I hope I hope people are listening get a lot of value because like there's actually so many more things I want to talk to you about. But I think I should end it here. I'll do a bit more research, bring you and Nima in and then we can yep. kind of talk about it more or not holistically but more specifically around yeah. like the way the government's headed what's ed like and all those things i think yeah. a lot of people would definitely be interested in listening to that but i'll call it here thanks man thank you thanks for having it
it was uh, really good. <laughs> it was nice chatting. Uh, easy. All right, we're going to call it now so we can play Baldur's Gate 3. See ya. Yes, very important. Ciao.